Right now, I have the privilege of standing here to thank every one of you for your help in making Forever Case, a campaign for our community, such a remarkable success. $7.5 million. Amazing. More than any of us ever thought we could do. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 annual meeting of the members of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. My name is Liz Murley, and it's my honor and pleasure to be serving as president and chair of the board this year. Before we begin today's program, I want to thank our sponsors for this meeting. They are Noise Hall and Allen Insurance, Saco and Bitterford Savings, Remax Oceanside, and Frank and Nancy Strout. I also want to thank our staff for all of their hard work in putting today's meeting together. The Land Trust has just ended another phenomenal year made possible by all of your support. You make such general, generous financial donations to fund our work, but you do so much more than that. You get out on the trails with your saws and your rakes and your trowels and even our tractor. You tell our neighbors about it, us, and sometimes you even ask them for money on our behalf. You build bridges, both literally and figuratively. You serve on committees and task forces in the advisory council. You teach in our exec educational programs and you attend those programs. And sometimes you even have good natured bidding battles over paintings at our Paint for Preservation fundraiser each year. For all of that and more, we thank you. It is the season for taking stock of everything we have to be thankful for. And in a moment, our executive director, Cindy Crum, is going to go into the details of everything we've collectively accomplished this year. Before she does that though, I want to leave you with one very fun fact that for me encapsulates CELT's conservation work over the past 36 years. At the start of fiscal 21, the year we are reporting on today, CELT had conserved 768 acres here in Cape, either through direct ownership or by easements. With the addition of the agricultural easement on 76 acres at Maxwell Farm Dyer Field this year, that number is now 844 acres. Cindy is about to tell you about a new project involving just six acres, but six very critical acres that will take that number to 850 this spring. When that happens, CELT will have conserved more land than the total acreage of Central Park in New York City and just over 9% of this town. I believe that is something to be thankful for and I know that all of you do as well. And with that, I will pass things on to Cindy. Thank you, Liz. That is impressive. So I am so happy that all of you have joined us here this afternoon. I wish we could be in person, but this will work out well too. Thank you for being part of the CELT community and making this amazing year at CELT possible. We have so many accomplishments and I will reflect on the highlights during this talk and you will see some photos of some of these important projects as well. So lands, recently I was out kayaking around Cushing Island, my small boat rising on the gentle ocean swells. And as I was looking out to the rocks, the ocean and sky, I thought of Wendell Berry's line in a poem. I come into the peace of wild things. 
Well, this is an opportunity that CELT provides on a daily basis for so many people. People look out to the sea at Trendy Point or walk through the fields and woods of Runaway Farm. Here they know that the natural world has been preserved and they can slow down and connect to these special places. When I meet with landowners to talk about conserving their property, I am so touched by what I would call their reverence for the land that they care for. This is what inspires them to protect it forever and share it with others. This sentiment was very evident when last summer, the Cape Elizabeth United Methodist Church's entire congregation voted and they made the decision to enter into a purchase and sale agreement with the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust for a conservation easement. 6.6 .6 acres, which is about two thirds of their land. Steve Hill, chair of their administrative council said, this easement is an important part of our focus on an environmental ministry and protecting the world around us. This is very moving. For the community, this will provide access from the town center to Robinson Woods and secure the last segment of the Crosstown Trail to be protected in perpetuity. So it really looks forward to a signing, I mean, to a closing on this property in May. And as you know, during the last year, SELT also acquired the 76 acre conservation easement on Maxwell Farm Dyer Field between Spurwink and Sawyer Roads. Again, this is a property where the landowners, Nate and Kathy Maxwell, care deeply about the land and are committed to having that property farmed forever. Years ago, it was an iceberg lettuce farm, and now some vegetables, including corn, are still grown there. Much of the land provides hay for a small herd of cattle on the farm. So stewardship, taking care of these properties. One of the big projects this year in stewardship was building bridges on our properties. We built a new bridge over Pollock Creek on our Wanaway Farm property which connects now the 20 acre parcel that we have owned for many years to the 30 acre parcel purchased during the campaign. Connecting those two parcels creates one 50 acre preserve. The bridge spanning 32 feet was the largest trail structure we have ever built with volunteer labor. When the volunteers and staff realized that the primary beams for the new bridge would be 32 feet and weigh 720 pounds each. Creative problem solving was needed, but they figured it out and got those beams all the way down the trail into the woods. Another bridge was recently built thanks to the Boy Scouts. This bridge crosses a beautiful small stream in our 2019 Robinson Woods acquisition, also with campaign funds. I recommend you walk this new trail, it's beautiful. At this time, I would like to take a moment to honor Marin Robinson. Selt has expressed their sympathies to the family for their loss. And we thank so many of you for your memorial gifts in her honor. Marin was always a strong supporter in the family for the preservation of what is now a 197 acre Robinson Woods Preserve. Also in stewardship, the CELT board committed to a three year invasive species management plan. And last year was the first very successful year. A stewardship assistant and two interns worked tirelessly to help with this over the summer and one of our dedicated stewardship volunteers coordinated the efforts with staff. Planning with US Fish and Wildlife Service for New England Cottontail Rabbit Habitat Management has been a part of this effort as well. We are now in the second year of our invasive species plant management plan. And one reason we clear invasives, perhaps 
the major reason we clear them is to allow for native species to return and flourish. There needs to be a place for wild things in Wendell Berry's words, and CELT's focus on habitat protection is a critical part of our stewardship work. We have many committed volunteers who immediately clear trees when they fall across trails and work on a variety of trail management projects. Thank you. At Turkey Hill Farm, a new shed was completed and the Cape Elizabeth Garden Club worked with other volunteers to begin transitioning the lovely gardens around the house and barn to native species. And education, a critical part of CELT's work, we have returned to pre-pandemic programming with the elementary school field trips and with community programs. Please look at the Cape Community Services offerings to sign up. We held one virtual and then two actual cross-town walks this year. Our fourth grade walks this fall had all five classes visiting the wildflower trail in Robinson Woods to explore the food web and signs of fall in the forest. We have started a seventh and eighth grade program at Turkey Hill Farm this fall. Once a week, over two days, 80 students participate in place-based programming. Lessons that bring classroom topics into the real world. It is already clear that this project has made middle school more meaningful for these students. Our program coordinator, Philip, overheard one student who was standing in the chicken coop at the time, say verbatim, I love school. That's impressive. As part of the place-based education philosophy, students are not just exploring the land, but also giving back to it. Last week, a seventh grade team arrived to practice map making skills and invasive plant identification helping contribute to our ongoing efforts to manage and mitigate invasive species. We are so thankful to the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation who helped kickstart this seventh and eighth grade project providing most of the startup funding through the school. This is not our first, but it is clearly our largest and most direct collaboration with CEEP. We are excited to continue to work with them to support outdoor and environmental education in Cape. And this year we installed picture posts for community focused climate change education. A citizen science project in partnership with the Cape Elizabeth schools and funded by the Casco Bay Estuary Partnership. Picture posts are simple installations where Citizen scientists, anyone, you, with a camera or smartphone can monitor and document change in local ecosystems, particularly as it pertains to climate change impacts. Please check out these posts. And as we often like to say, we are creating the stewards of tomorrow with our education programs. But none of this work would be possible without the support from all of you. As you saw in the opening video, we celebrated the completion of an incredibly successful $7.5 million campaign. Again, thank you. The generosity of our supporters and volunteers makes this work possible and allows CELT to continue our focus on habitat protection recreation, and farmland. It has been such a great year, more members this year than ever. So a heartfelt welcome to you all, our members. Now I would like to invite the staff to come on the screen. Please wave as I say your name.
There she is. And Dan, if you want to take your video off, or put your video on, I mean, sorry. Um, but anyway, we have two new staff. One is Ardeth Dixon, our stewardship manager. Welcome, Ardeth. And also Diane Manning. Yes, there you are, Hi. Diane Manning, <laughs> our um, administrative and finance coordinator. And Philip Matthew is now a full-time program coordinator. Thank you, Philip. And Patty Renault, our steadfast membership and development manager. So I'd really like to thank all of the staff and thank all of you who have joined us here today and those who couldn't be with us. We really appreciate everyone's work. And Paint for Preservation was also highly successful this year as an online event. And so next we will be seeing a video of Paint for Preservation and there will be a presentation. So thanks again. My name is Claudia Drico, and I have been involved with Paint for Preservation since its inception. Paint for Preservation was an idea conceived by Cape resident and artist Marianne Carey 14 years ago as a fundraiser for SELT and a way to bring attention to the land that SELT would like to protect. That first year, we were a committee of three. We had no budget, only one sponsor, that a friend approached because we were not brave enough to ask, and we accepted every artist that applied. Paint for Preservation has evolved to become the premier plein air auction in Maine, attracting the top plein air painters in the state and beyond. The term plein air painting means painting in the open air, in other words, outside, on location, rather than in a studio. It is a practice that was made popular by the Impressionists, and it was revolutionary at the time. For the 14th year, the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust continued its tradition of bringing plein air artists to Cape Elizabeth for a weekend of painting Cape's beautiful and iconic landscapes including farms, coastline, lighthouses, marshes, and woods. This year the artists braved unusual heat and abundant mosquitoes, but still were able to create stunning pieces of art. Thank you. Uh, what began as a casual conversation between two friends in 2007, Paint for Preservation has now grown into one of the premier art auctions in Maine, raising more than $70,000 each year to support SELT's land conservation, stewardship, and education programs. Although we've been online for the past two years, our signature event generally involves a three-day painting weekend with 30 artists, and an auction on Sunday afternoon with more than 400 attendees. The planning committee for P4P, as it's affectionately known, now has eight committee members. Claudia Drico is the chair, and members include Marianne Carey, her co-founder, Linda Ayotte, Nancy Kelly, Bill Lundberg, Catherine Leiden, Jan Muller, Sue Sturdivant, and myself. A sincere thank you for all that you do, for all the work that happens to conduct this event every year. Now, some of these folks have been volunteering for six years, but for all 14 years, 
well, now 15 years, Claudia and Marianne have been at the center. They've roped in their friends to volunteering. They've called in their family and kids at different parts. In fact, I think for most years, the entire Carey family has been bartending or catering. I'm sure they'll both tell you that despite the amount of work that it takes, and that's enormous, they have a lot of fun. In fact, we've rarely heard them whine at all. This steadfast volunteer commitment merits special recognition. Paint for Preservation would not be the amazing event that it is today without the two of you. So today we honor you and we thank you for your commitment for so many years. Now, since I can't give this to you in person, watch your email for your gift certificates to Wine Wise in Portland wine and food pairing education at its best. They offer wine and food delivery to your home and all sorts of wine-centered events for you to choose from. What could be better? So please enjoy whatever experience you choose, knowing of our deep, deep thanks for all that you have done and all that you continue to do. The P4P committee has already begun its work for 2022 we're planning to bring back a live event this year, fingers crossed. We're always looking for new committee members. So if you're interested, please just give me a call or an email at the office and stay tuned for the next Paint for Preservation 2022. Thank you so much, Patty. Traditionally, this is the part of the meeting where we thank our outgoing board members. Today, I want to begin by remembering Sherm Altenberg, who we lost very unexpectedly back in the spring. Sherm joined the board in December of 2018, but he was a CELT volunteer in many other capacities for years and years before that. He was a wise and steady and oh so sensible participant in our board conversations. And he was also a doer out on our properties. The next time you're at Turkey Hill Farm, think of Sherm as you pass the new shed, which he put so much work into. And also look for the tree that we've planted to remember him by. We also want to thank Sherm's family for naming Celt as a recipient of memorial gifts in Sherm's honor. And we thank all of you who have made or will make those gifts. We are very honored by them. And now I will turn to saying thank you to a few other members of the board. First, there are two members of our team who have come to the end of their board terms. And I wanna just talk about these two fabulous people for just a little bit. Wyman Briggs has served six years as self treasurer. And there's just simply no way for me to accurately sum up what that sentence means. Wyman jumped into that role, which is arguably the hardest one on any board from the minute he was elected. As CELT's finances have grown and become more and more complicated, Wyman has been there every step of the way, together with Cindy and our bookkeeper, Tracy, keeping the dollars and cents in all the right buckets. And we do talk a lot about buckets now. While Wyman is leaving the board, he has graciously agreed to continue serving on the finance committee to help our new treasurer, Dan, to get up to speed. Jan Muller has served nine years on the board, which is the maximum our bylaws allow. She has served on the executive committee and the finance committee, and she was our secretary for several years. CELT has benefited enormously from Jan's banking knowledge and her financial skills. In addition, she has been on the P4P committee for I honestly don't know how many years, consistently bringing in many thousands of dollars annually in sponsorship. Wyman and Jan, there is a very special gift on the way for each of you. These platters, and Philip is going to put a picture up if he hasn't already, um, were produced by Maine College of Art and Design student Emily Gieslin, who participated in an invasive species class held in collaboration with CELT this fall. Emily and her classmates visited our runaway farm preserve to learn about invasive plant removal, as well as the nuances of supporting New England cottontail habitat. I think Emily was inspired by the bunnies. We just love these platters and we hope you will too. We thank you, we will miss you, 
and we sincerely hope you won't go very far away. And second, we want to take a moment to thank Bill Loomberg for serving as president of CELT and chair of the board this past year. Bill was just crazy enough to say yes to chairing the board in the middle of a pandemic. And he went on to lead us with a steady hand and good humor through lots and lots of wins and also through some very difficult conversations. I sincerely hope that he is the last CELT president whose board meetings plus a board retreat take place 100% on Zoom. While Bill is no longer serving as president, we are very pleased that he's remaining on the board. And now, Bill, we were hoping that you might be able to say a few words. I'm gonna keep them brief because I know it's a long meeting. Um, I can't say how privileged I felt to serve as CELTS president for the last year. It was an incredibly exciting year. The acquisitions that were made, the progress in terms of uh, of so many things, including stewardship. I think the only mo other most exciting thing in my life was dealing with a uh, Labrador puppy. But uh, CELT most of the time kept me very busy. Uh, the staff is wonderful. I mean, the, 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 the future of, of CELT is in wonderful hands. Uh, the, the volunteers go beyond, uh, beyond what can reasonably be expected to, to do what we have to do to preserve our properties. And the leadership of the organization is just stellar. It was wonderful working with them and, I'm, and the future of CELD is in good hands. And the new president is gonna, is, gonna be a ter is gonna be terrific. And I think you're all gonna be just delighted with Liz uh, as she moves us forward. Thank you so much, Bill, um, on all fronts. To honor Bill's presidency and as a small token of our thanks, our very own Claudia Drico, who is a professional photographer when she's not running Paint for Preservation, has taken this photograph of Robinson Woods. And Bill, a framed version of it is coming your way. Um, we hope you will find a good spot for it, either here in Cape or on your very beloved Cliff Island. Thank you again. And now I will pass things on to Dennis Liner, who is co-chairing our governance committee this year for the business portion of our meeting. Thank you. I'd like to convene the business portion of the meeting. I have one formal responsibility, and that is to nominate Dan Geyer to serve as a member of the CELT Board of Directors for a three-year term expiring at the annual meeting in 2024. Do we have a second to the motion? Yes, it's Liz seconding. <laughs> Thanks, Liz. We've set up an online poll to allow all members to vote on this motion. Uh, take it away, Philip. Sure, so we'll be using the poll feature in Zoom to take this vote. You should be seeing any moment now a poll popping up on your screen that will give you the option to vote in favor or against the motion. It's also important to note that technically you need to be a current member to vote for this election. So if you know that you have donated a gift of at least $35 in the past year, you are a member. Um, if you're unsure, there's an option for that too. And if you're not, that's all okay. I hope you're still enjoying our annual meeting. So it looks like the votes are rolling in. Um, we're at 50% already. It's always a good sign when the votes do actually start rolling in when you say that out loud. So happy that things are going smoothly so far. All right, let's give it it looks like it's slowing down. So I'm gonna give it 10 more seconds if that's all right, Dennis. Get your vote in if you'd like.
All right. And I am happy to report that pending any craziness involving who is or isn't a member, Dan Gare has been elected unanimously. Thanks very much, Philip, and welcome, Dan. Next, I'd like to note to membership that as permitted by CELTS bylaws, the board has appointed three new board members to fill unexpired terms of board members who were not able to continue for a variety of reasons. In each case, their terms will expire at next year's annual meeting. We'd like to welcome Bob Ayotte, Mary Beth Richardson, and David Wenberg. It is also my pleasure to announce that the board has elected the following officers for the coming fiscal year. President and Secretary, Liz Murley. Vice President, David Bryman. Treasurer, Dan Geyer. Executive Committee Member at Large, Suzanne McGinn. Finally, I'd like to thank the fiscal year 2021 committee chairs, many who have agreed to continue serving as chairs for fiscal year 21-22. The chairs for fiscal year 21-22 are Education, Lisa Gent, Finance, Dan Geyer is replacing Wyman Briggs, Governance, Dennis Liner and Kathleen Janik, co-chairs replacing Liz Murley, Lands, David Bryman, Membership and Development, Celeste Bannock, Stewardship, Ryan DeBruin and Chris Tullman, co-chairs, Paint for Preservation, Claudia Drico. I'd like to remind members that there is always a need for additional committee members. Please contact any staff or board member if you have an interest in serving. Thank you, and back to you, Cindy. Thank you, Dennis. Now I have the pleasure of introducing everyone to Keith Carson, a CAPE resident who is currently the meteorologist at New Center, Maine in Portland. Keith is, was raised amongst woodland creatures in the fields of central Massachusetts and became interested in the weather at a young age. He now specializes in forecasting and climate analysis. He says, weather was always my passion, but climate change has grown on me. On News Center Maine's nightly broadcasts, Keith doesn't just deliver the weather forecast, but will wade into complex math to explain a certain scientific phenomena. On Twitter, he delves even deeper, taking on the politics of climate change. Over the last five years, Keith's interest in and knowledge of climate change science has greatly increased. He sees his work on climate change as much about defending science as about defending the earth. This afternoon, Keith is going to share with us some insights on how we can talk about climate change to try to move the needle a bit for people who don't seem to care. There will be a Q&A session after Keith's presentation. You can submit your questions on the Q at the Q&A button on your screen. Do not put your question into the chat as we will not be monitoring that. Our program coordinator, Philip, and also our technical coordinator for this meeting, Philip Matthew, will moderate the questions after Keith's presentation. So please join me with a warm welcome and a thank you for Keith. Thank you, uh, and thank you, Patty, for coordinating this. Um, so the, the reason I wanna talk a little bit about how to reach people on climate changes. A lot of times, uh, if I'm invited to speak, whether it be a union concerned scientists or uh, conservation, um, people who are attending these meetings are inherently already on board as far as climate change being a threat. And so for me to drone on about what's going on, um, I don't know that it, it really helps too much. So what we really need to do, I think, is try to talk to people about how to talk to other people who are maybe not on board with climate change. So that's what this presentation is gonna take you through. And then any questions you have after, um, obviously we will uh, address as we can. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen here and give you an idea of, um, of how to get through to people. Well, the best we can at least. Can't always get it done. All right, so uh, 
we're going to start with the players. And, and by the players, I mean the types of people that I've come across. Um, it makes me feel old saying this, but it's been about 15 years or so that I've talked to kind of the general public as a TV meteorologist about climate change. So dividing people into groups, this is kind of what you uh, come up with here. So on the top left, you have people who are alarmed. Um, they're all in on, on climate change and they think this is you know, one of the biggest issues in the world right now. And so um, there might be some of those people in this meeting right now. Um, I know people like that. And so you, it, more or less, you don't have to worry about them, right? Um, preaching to the choir is, is the phrase that comes to mind. In, in the middle there, you have people who are on board. They don't doubt the science of climate change. They care, but maybe it's not like a top of the mind type issue to them. It's something that is lurking in the background or in, in the future. Um, those people we can do a little work on, um, but for the most part, you know, when it comes down to legislating things and getting things done on climate change, they're going to be pretty on board. Okay, skeptical. This is the group that we really are trying to reach here, and they truly believe from what they've heard or, or what they've been told that the science on this is kind of out. The jury's still out a little bit as to, you know, all right, so the climate is changing, but is it really humans that are causing it? And so this is a group that we really try to focus on because they're skeptical, but they're not um, unreachable. They're not dug in. On the bottom here, uh, two groups that you're not going to have a lot of success with. And so one is just the classic true denier. So I've met quite a few of these on Facebook. And, I, and <laughs> to be honest with you, I'm amazed the level of research they go into to try to disprove the science of climate change. And if you could harness that energy and use it for something good, man, you'd have a, you'd have a lot going for you. But uh, unfortunately, these are people that will go against any real scientific peer reviewed evidence, and um, it just has to fit into the confirmation bias. And in the past, I'd engaged more with these people. Um, but what I found is even if you back them into a corner, they're never going to say that they're they made a mistake or maybe they need to reevaluate. They'll either just go away, uh, like stop responding or throw some sort of insult and walk away. So you're not going to really have any luck with that. And it's the same with the conspiracy theorists. They're a different group to me. Conspiracy theorists are um, are universally like in uh, against science and what seems normal. So they think a lot of things are a conspiracy and climate change is just one of them. So that's another one you kind of have to um, stray away from. They're, they're different in their intent than the denier, but the idea is the same, which is evidence is not going to, um, is not going to really move the needle. So skeptical and on board are the, are the groups you really want to focus on. And so what are we here? Um, you know, the, I used to hear 10 years ago, I used to hear more often, um, it's not warming, the climate is not changing. You know, uh, it's an urban heat aisle, they put thermometers where there are airports, the airports have more blacktop, all this other stuff. That argument has, has gone away largely. I just think it's become untenable in nature. Um, everybody can see that we're warming now. So I haven't heard that as much. What I hear much more often now is it's a natural cycle. And so it's a reasonable thing. If you're not paying attention and or you don't want to, for sure, the climate has undergone a lot of natural cycles. And so what I've spent a lot of time on recently, we just did a climate special on Channel 6 uh, a couple of weeks ago, is how we know it's humans. And I think that's really, really important because those who are casually involved and maybe just aren't that interested in changing their habits, that's what they're going to fall back on is how we know it's us. And within that, you know, maybe it's the sun, it's volcanoes, it's water vapor, um, anything that, that's natural is where they want this to, to be. Um, and so being skeptical is the heart of science. You'll hear that a lot too. You'll say, you know, here's all the science. They say, well, the point of science is for me to be skeptical. And I always tell people, yeah, that's true. In a peer reviewed nature, that, that's how you do that. You don't just get to say that this is false, this data, and um, and that's being skeptical. That That's just being not ignorant, but um, you're, just, you're just not paying attention. Being skeptical is part of science, but you have to do it through the process. Um, and then it's a hoax. It, again, if you get to that level um, where the word hoax is used, I'm gonna say your chances of success are, are really minimal at, at that point um, because now it's a little bit of an emotional thing. So the, it's a cycle. And I have a, on my Facebook page, and I believe we have it on our New Center YouTube, I have a video called how you know how we know it's us 
And if you want to watch that sometime, I think it's a really succinct version of how we know it's us. Short version is um, we know it's not the sun because the stratosphere, the layer above the troposphere here has been cooling at least since the 1970s. So for it to be the sun, it couldn't be cooling that layer coming down here and baking us. Um, we measure solar irradiance, the incoming uh, energy from the sun. We've been measuring that for quite a while. It's been consistent and if not lower over time as we've rapidly warmed. So you can eliminate the sun. The other um, talking point that I think is really good is we know specifically the CO2 that is in the atmosphere at a record levels right now is from fossil fuels. And the way we know that is something uh, called a C14 isotope. So C14 isotope is one of three naturally occurring isotopes uh, in our atmosphere, but it's radioactive. So it decays about every 6,000 years is the half-life. The result of that is from fossil fuels that have been in the ground for so long, they don't have C14 in them, whereas the rest of our CO2 has that C14 isotope in it. So we've been able to measure the ratio of C14 over time and found that it's drastically fallen over time as our general CO2 has been rising. And the reason for that is because it's from these fossil fuels that have been in the ground so long that the C14 has, has gone from them. So we know specifically it's a fingerprint for fossil fuels that that's where it uh, comes from. So those are just a couple of uh, points, but again, that video um, on my Facebook page or, or, or our YouTube page, I think, is really helpful. So those are the talking points that you may hear. And, and if you get to It's a Hoax, um, you might want to just hang it up. Uh, it's, it usually doesn't work out from there. Okay, so what, what works, what doesn't? What doesn't work, and um, you'll hate, you'll hate I hate to, to use the word the media because I am part of it and I don't think the media is a real thing. There's so many different versions. But one thing I do see sometimes on other outlets who are just reading or online is the scary stuff. And the scary stuff, I know why we think it works. Like your city will be underwater in 20 years, we're past the point of no return, weather will become more extreme. The problem with this, and, and I, don't, I don't dispute the reality of this is, it makes people feel hopeless, like they can't do anything anyways. You know what I mean? So you don't wanna be at a place where you're telling people it's too late, we're kind of screwed anyways. Well, well, why does that make somebody wanna do something that's gonna impact their life? You know, presumably some sort of sacrifice to reduce carbon if it's already too late, if our cities are all gonna be underwater anyways. So I don't think that stuff works. And I also think that it seems sensationalist. And if you do this and you make an exact projection and, and you know, Al, Al Gore was guilty of this and inconvenient truth. And I know he was trying to do something good, but if you give an exact year or a couple of years that you expect something really drastic happen and it doesn't quite happen, it's gonna look really bad. It doesn't mean you weren't on the right track. Maybe you're only off by five or 10 years, but that type of stuff, is, is fodder for people who are gonna be really skeptical anyways. And it just sounds like a scare tactic. Do what I want or this is gonna happen. So I tend to talk about like cities being underwater, for example, as a cost thing. Like, look, we could, we could adapt. We can um, change these roads, roads and bridges and make them taller and reinforce buildings. And, but man, that's gonna be really expensive, right? Compared to reducing carbon now. So I, I tend to take a more pragmatic approach there and I, I stay away from the, your city is gonna be underwater or it's gonna be, or it's gonna be uninhabitable. Cause I, I don't think that's really where we're going. Certainly we're gonna have some big problems, but um, I, I don't believe that man isn't smart enough to um, adapt to that, but the cost could be uh, tremendous. Okay, so here's something that does work. Scary, doesn't really work. What does work I found is let them walk into it. And what I mean by that is, if someone says to you, this is all just a natural cycle, then what, what I like to say is, okay, what natural cycle exactly do you think is responsible for this warming? So that way they have to give you an answer that they think is correct, and then you can correct it from there. So most often it's the sun. And as I mentioned, there's a good way to, to refute that. Um, but it, sometimes it's volcanoes. It's worth noting that volcanoes are typically a net cooler for the earth. They spew so much debris into the upper atmosphere that it blocks a lot of the sun. Um, the 1816, I believe it was, year without summer, 
um, Maine was part of that. That was from a big volcanic um, eruption. And the name of that volcano is escaping me. But either way, um, I think it's good to ask people if they think it's a natural cycle, what's causing it? Or um, if they think, you know, uh, polluting isn't bad, well, why not? Like give, make them present the argument, which makes it easier for you to kind of knock it down rather than you droning on. And then they say, well, I knew all that, but I still think it's whatever. Um, so I, I find this works really well, especially in like a social media setting where someone's got to type something because then when you refute it, they either have to admit they're wrong or they delete the comment, which that happens. That's how, that's how humans work. Rather than admit it, just delete it. Um, okay, another thing that doesn't work well, doomsday related to that to some degree, future tense. So that might seem funny coming from me because that's what I do. I talk in future tense, but I'm comfortable doing that because I know our skill level is good forecasting five to 10 days out. Future tense in climate change is, is difficult because we know what we're doing and we know what that's done to our atmosphere. And we have climate models that project forward, but a lot of things can happen that can change the little iterations in our warming. Um, La Nina, El Nino, um, there's other teleconnections that can slow down or speed up what is man-made warming. And so I don't like to spend as much time talking about the projections of where we're going. They're important for planning, but I, I don't think they do well because people think of the future as being inherently uncertain. So if you say to them, you know, we're going to be four degrees Celsius by you know, 2100, they think, yeah, well, you know, Jim Cramer told me this stock would be 300 in a couple of weeks and it's not. And, um, you know, the pundits predicted the Patriots would go undefeated and they didn't. So I think when you're talking future tense, it somehow diminishes the reality of this. I spend almost all my time in the space of what's already happened for warming and why we know it's us. I don't spend a ton of time on what that's gonna mean in the future. Um, we've done stories on it. Don Kerrigan did some great ones on, on uh, you know, fisheries and lobstermen, but I, I tend to spend more time on what we know for sure. And I don't project it as much into the future. Um, and this is, I don't know if any of you ever read the book, Win-Win um, Negotiation. Uh, my dad made me read it long ago. And you know, one of, the, one of the premises of any negotiation, although it's been lost in maybe in our culture recently, is in order to win a negotiation, win, both people have to feel like they won a little bit. And so if you go in to somebody who's skeptical and you just, just destroy them with you know, facts and you maybe you're a little smug about it, well, they're not gonna, you give them no room to admit they might've been misguided or didn't know as much about it. So you have to give people a little room to say, okay, well, I didn't, you know, I didn't expect that you would know that. Or like a lot of people don't realize this is, is one of the quotes I use here because that way people take the pressure off them. Oh, you're not calling them ignorant. You're just saying, you know, like C14, do, do most people know that? Not really. So if you communicate that, they shouldn't feel embarrassed that they didn't know that. And it's an extra piece of information that they've learned about uh, climate change and how we know it's us. And there's nothing to be ashamed of there. So I think all of this, you have to soften it and give people little outs. And, and even one of them is, I don't do a ton on the solutions. I mean, I've done a little on electric cars recently, um, mainly because I think they're super cool. Um, I mean, that's a whole nother topic for another day, but I do a little on that, a little on heat pumps. But most of it is me just telling you, hey, we know for sure it's us. What we do, the legislation that comes out of it, um, that's really not my, my topic. Because I think if I delve into that, into what I think should be done, well, now that becomes politics a little bit, right? Um, what bills should be passed and how that should be done. Should we tax people? I don't want to get in that lane of, of the political um, solutions, what price we're willing to pay, so to speak. So I try to stay just into the, the lane mainly of, you know, we know it's us, it's a problem. Why don't you guys all figure out what you think we should um, do about that? And the last thing that I find works is small dose science. And so I talked about C14 um, in the atmosphere. If you can, linking to a, a credible source about that is really, really good. Um, and this sounds wild, but it's just true. It's what I've noticed in the last... Uh, five years especially, is that your sources have to be very carefully picked. 
um, there are people who don't think NPR is a very reliable source. Um, there's people who, who don't think, uh, we could go down the line, who don't think NBC is a reliable source. Now, obviously I don't agree with that, but, but that's where we're at. So I try to, when possible, link directly to the actual peer reviewed paper or um, a source that links to it that is British or Canadian. That sounds so crazy, but talking to like, you know, The Guardian or one of these polls have actually showed that Americans trust uh, international headlines more than anything that's domestic. So that goes to science as well. So when I link anything like that, I do try to make sure that it's um, a source that no one's going to fight about. Because if you get into that thing, then you're never getting out of it. Because if they don't believe your sources, then um, nothing you say is really uh, going to turn that around. So those are, those are some of the main things that I've learned um, from doing this. And, and all this to be said is I'm, I'm not a perfect communicator at this. Um, I don't always get it right. I have learned over time that, you know, dunking on someone, so to speak, you might feel good about it, but it's not going to help the situation. So most of the time, unless someone's malicious, you try to educate and you got to know when to walk away if that person is not interested in that. I've also learned for me personally, sometimes taking it offline and um, having them direct message me is much more effective because they don't feel like they have to um, take a particular stance and, and kind of die on that hill um, in a public forum. They feel more comfortable saying, oh, you know, I didn't really realize that or, you know, I'll, I'll think about it um, in, in a private message than they would in a uh, more public forum. So that was the lessons that I've learned um, talking to people about climate change. Um, and I'll open up to questions about that or anything related to it. Thank you so much, Keith. Um, I think we've all been in those conversations, so it's great to hear sort of your top takes on how to approach those. We do have one question in the chat that I've already seen in the Q&A. And I'll start there. It's sort of a different version of the idea of how just how much different information there is going around about climate change. You know, on top of the fact that there's a million different sources, um, there's always up new information and updates to predictions and things like that. So my question to you is, where do you either go to yourself or point people towards when you're trying to, you know, get the facts straight? Yeah, it's a good question. Um... You know, it, it's almost it's almost one that's that's become a little bit abstract for me because I've been following it so much that I, I have these like hot links that I've saved to a lot of these um, peer reviewed uh, pieces. But I guess the short answer is I usually try to go right to the paper. So any topic that I just talked about, whether it be C14 in the atmosphere or solar irradiance, if you put those correctly into your Google um, you will find the actual paper. Now it's, you know, do you want to hang out reading that? I, I don't know, but I, I think usually that's the way to go. Um, I do think if you have to take a more mainstream source, um, although there are people who don't like the NPRs of the world, I think that's a good place to start. They have a whole series on climate change that I think is pretty solid. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I like to go right to the actual paper often they're PDFs, most of them are free online. Um, and I'm trying to think who else did, um, I believe PBS did a really good um, web series as well uh, along the lines of how we know it's humans um, mm -hmm. that I pointed people to. It's, it's, it's pretty slick and I don't think you're gonna get too many people uh, arguing with, with the facts of it. Great, thank you. Um, another question from the Q&A panel. How do you feel about climate change as a term? I know we used to call it global warming, other terms like climate disruption, climate catastrophe get thrown around. How do you feel about climate change in quotes? And thank you, Susan, for the question. Um, I wish we had never changed it, to be completely honest hmm. with you. Um, I think, so the reason behind it was from going from global warming to climate change was polling found that climate change was too politically polarized of a term. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, global warming was too politically polarized. Um, how'd that work out for us? I mean, I, I think, I think uh, changing the term doesn't change the basis behind it. And something I've heard a lot from people who are really against it is 
it must have not warm fast enough so you have to change the name. So I actually often will use them interchangeably even though global warming has almost become a code for people who don't believe in it. Like most often when you hear people say global warming, dot, 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 it's something about it being not real or not happening. So I, you know, I have no input on this. I wish we had never changed it from um, global warming. And I certainly wouldn't want to change it again. I think we just got to keep it where it's at. And the climate catastrophe is like a lower third headline you'll see sometimes. But I think that goes back to what I was saying before is like the scarier it is for people, you can um, invite this idea that what's the point in us trying to fix it if we're already in trouble. Sure. So when you, when you do go into sort of a new conversation and you do need to sort of pull a single stat or a couple stats, are there particular ones that you tend to lean on more regularly? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the sun one, you've got to get the sun out of the way for people. Um, and so I've got a folder on my work desktop that's just a bunch of graphics. NASA actually has a great solar irradiance graphic. Um, so you've got to get the sun out of the way because that's the most natural, it seems uh, like um, obvious, although I sometimes joke to people who I know better who say that, I say, They've been studying this since the, the 60s. You really think they didn't look into, <laughs> didn't look into it potentially being the giant um, you know, sphere in the sky. But, um, but I think you got to get the sun out of the way. And I also think sometimes you have to lean a little bit on the fact that forget about, even if you forget about climate change, should we, is it desirable to be polluting? in general. So like people argue still about mm. natural gas and coal because they say, well, I don't care that much about climate change. Well, what about all the other stuff? I mean, there was a time when we were all pretty unified on the idea that it wasn't good to be burning these fuels in general because um, it's not just CO2 that they produce, right? Um, so sometimes I go back to that a little bit is like, why wouldn't you want solar and wind just from that standpoint, um, even if you don't want to have the whole conversation about um, about climate change. And so, so I think that, yeah, the sun, the pollutant aspect of it, and then some of it is just technology that's better anyways. And I harp on that with the uh, electric car thing. Like it's not that it's better for everyone yet. And I understand that, but anybody who owns one or gets in one walks away saying, this is clearly the future. And so, so arguing about how much it's gonna save the planet is almost irrelevant. Like it's just a better technology. It's like the first time I picked up an iPhone. Um, so sometimes you have to work around people's objections and say, well, what are we really, what are you really arguing for? Do you want more coal? Do you want more natural gas? Like what, what, what are we arguing about here? Definitely. So I think um, there's a couple of questions coming in that are related to the same idea, but what do you see as sort of current steps forward happening, whether it's related to COP26, with just, which just ended, or other sort of things like that? Yeah, I mean, I think for all the discourse, the United States is, is not doing a, a bad job. And you, you know, this is another thing you'll hear a lot, I'm sure, guys, is, is uh, why should we bother if China's still going to do right. what China's going to do? You'll hear that a lot. And and look, I mean, there's a little truth to that. China overtook us in 2005 as the top um, emitter. But two things that are worth noting. Um, one is we're still per capita much higher than China. You can't ignore the population. And uh, two is we're still cumulatively the biggest CO2 emitter in uh, modern history. So we can't get off the hook that easy, but steps are, I think a lot of it honestly has to come at the commercial and an industrial level. Like it's great that uh, we'll come here and we will put use heat pumps and we'll drive the electric car or, or hybrid, it's, it's important, it is, but it still kind of pales in comparison to the energy and the, and the pollution that's caused at the industrial and commercial level. So I think one of the biggest things is putting pressure on companies um, to, to do the right thing socially. And I think we're going in that direction. I mean, you're even seeing Shell and Exxon and all these companies try to come up with a cleaner image because it's bad business. And I think as soon as the consumer doesn't want to do business with a heavily polluting, a heavily carbon intensive company, that does a lot more good than, uh, like I said, than, you know, us switching from oil to, to heat pump. Not that that's not helpful, but 
scale wise, um, I think the bit that's the biggest thing is making it uncool to, to be carbon heavy. And I, I think we're getting there a little. I mean, I get catalogs for clothes that I can't afford that are often like carbon, low carbon. And, and I think in like ski areas are saying we're going to be carbon neutral. And so the pressure comes from the public. And even if the companies don't care about the environment, they don't want to lose money. And I think that's how we, we get it done is we make it uh, a prerequisite to do business with them. Great. Um, I've got two more questions before we let you go. Um, so the first is what do you think the role of land trusts and maybe conservation in general is in this part of the of, of combating climate change? Well, I mean, I think it's important. Um, I, I think obviously the more land you can have doing its natural thing, the, the better, because that's one thing we didn't discuss much is carbon sinks. You know, I mean, we know we're putting a lot of carbon out. We can't get it all back in natural ways, but the more land is functioning the way it should, whether it be wetlands here protecting against sea level rise, which is, is something that's going to be big here in Maine, or just allowing trees to take carbon back in, in a natural way. Um, it, it's really important. And it's especially important probably in places where that land would be used for something completely clear cutty. So whether it be, um, you know, obviously that's one of the issues with beef and, and I'm not going to tell you I'm a vegetarian, but, but they have to clear cut so much land in a lot of places and South America is a big place for it, that it not only is it a, a big CO2 emitter to produce the beef, but they've lost all these carbon sinks. So I think um, it's important to preserve as much nature as we can to get that carbon sink going. And again, like I said, the wetlands and the marshlands here are particularly important because they probably will shield us a little bit from the sea level rise that we've um, helped create. Definitely. Thank you. And I think that's that definitely ties in a lot with what the land trust does and how we start to think about our role. And I'm, I know that other land trusts do as well. So my last question is just sort of coming back to that original chart you showed of the different people. I think there's probably a lot of folks attending this that have been in the alarmed category at one time or another. It sounds like perhaps you were as well. Um, and my question is, it can be really exhausting being sort of at that point. Is, is there anywhere that you sort of turn to when you're feeling burned out or to look for in general hope on something like this that can at times feel so monumental? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. My wife um, sometimes asks me, hey, you do all this, but you don't, you don't often seem all that, you know, stressed about it. Um, I, I think, I think um, the thing that makes me feel better is that technology a lot of the technology that will help us with this is advancing rapidly and it's becoming um, like a no brainer option in, in general. And, and I use the example again of like, like the electric car or the heat pump. These are things that people are, are gonna start adopting just because they're better technology. And I do think the social awareness, at least in this country has reached close to the point that we need it to be to influence these companies to, um, to do the right thing for their bottom line and be socially responsible in that way. So, I, I, you know, it, it obviously concerns me what we've already set in motion, but I do think that the, it's just, there's a very small percentage of the country that thinks it's cool to, to blow you know, coal out your tailpipe now. I mean, I think we've gotten to the point where even though there's a, there's a vocal little minority that you'll see on, on uh, you know, Twitter especially, I think most people realize we need to do something. And that is a big part of, of um, this going forward. I think one of our biggest challenges actually um, is balancing seeing the world with protecting it. I mean, one of the things that I struggle with is I like to travel. And hmm. those transatlantic flights are almost equivalent to being car free for a year if you would if you would have can them I mean they're they're big so that's one area that I I worry about a little bit myself is I want to go and do all these things and see the world and, and we should well how do we balance that with being socially responsible I think that's the thing that stresses maybe me out <laughs> less than the big picture is uh is that like how do we get that to a reasonable point but I I don't think it's hopeless I think we've got enough technology to offset a lot of this I worry that we'll become stratified um, based on money. You know, oh, yeah. the United States can handle it. 
but can these other countries handle it? And so um, it's a humanitarian thing for people to try to do the right thing in countries that can afford it to keep countries that can't afford it um, out of harm's way. Um, but all you can do is advocate and educate and, and uh, when it comes time to vote on things, vote the way you think is, is the best way to help all of that. Absolutely. I think that's a great message to end on as well. I know Cindy's going to come on in just a second to thank you officially, but is there anywhere that you want to send people other than Channel 6 um, to engage with you or keep up with what you're up to? Um, no, you know, I just, I have the, just the Facebook and uh, Twitter. And if you like um, adorable toddlers, Instagram, but uh, that's, that's <laughs> pretty much, I don't do as much science on Instagram, just to warn you, that's going to be more pictures of Luca, but I do quite a bit of the um, climate change stuff on, on Facebook, especially. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Keith. What an engaging presentation. And I mean, one of the more critical topics ever. And we have this um, bag of gifts for you that we will deliver. So I just thought I'd show it to you since I can't hand it to you. Thank you. Um, so, so thanks again. And, um, and this is just about going to conclude our, our meeting. I did want to also thank our sponsors for this meeting, which is Noise Hall and Allen Insurance, Remax Oceanside, Sacco and Biddeford Savings Institution, and Frank and Nancy Strout. Thank you all. And in closing, um, the following vid video will hopefully inspire you and remind you of why we are all here together this afternoon, showing you the lands. And just a reminder, with the holiday season coming up, please make sure you leave space to enter into the peace of wild things. Thanks so much for joining us.